politics at New York University. Uh, it used to be called political science when I went to school, but they've wised up now, right? Uh, in some departments it's politics, in some it's called political science, and in some it's called government. It's all the same thing. Um, when it's been politics here since... At NYU, as long as I've okay, been here. All right. Well. Um, Bertel is the author of uh, many books. I remember uh, a book on uh, Marx and Wilhelm Reich, a book on alienation, a book on the U.S. Constitution. And uh, he's planning a book on how to cheat on, oh no, how to pass college exams. But you have, you do have two new books out, would you like to tell our audience about them? Well, there's a book here, I can move the people see it. Hold it up and I'll zoom in on it. This is a, a book on dialectics, what it is, how to use it. And here's a book which has just come out, which is a debate on market socialism. People's, uh, people's, uh, stop the people's stock market. Right. Hey, nice cover. Like they, like they have the people's bomb on their back when they got their first time well, the, the people's bomb. The people who are arguing on behalf of market socialism, I'm, I'm arguing against those who are arguing on behalf of it are talking about what could be after capitalism uh, in uh, the advanced countries. So uh, it's, not it's, not about China. China. it's not about China, it's about trying to use certain market mechanisms of uh, exchange inside a basically social society. Oh, good one. <laughs> no, uh, I, I think well, that, that's exactly what I tell them. Um, to, uh, I'd like to discuss uh, I haven't told you this topic before. You haven't. This is something of a mystery to me. But uh, you're a polymath, so you can talk about everything. I want to talk about the future of socialism. Uh -huh. And uh, I'd like to start uh, by my, although it's not, a, in my opinion, not really a, a socialist country. Or maybe it was, we had one percent of socialism. Uh, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed. It stayed at the end, and what, uh, I have my own theories, but what do you think was the cause of its uh, collapse and its inability to progress from a rather shaky stop to uh, something much better? Let me stick with your first question, which is the future of socialism, and then you jumped immediately into the Soviet Union, as if in some way that helps us understand the future of socialism. Well, that's what everyone, that's, that's what everyone is. But I didn't expect you to be higher but, uh, than you have to consider the fact that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union has meant that all the ideologues uh, to the left of Clinton uh, think that uh, it means uh, the collapse of some kind of socialism. To me, if, uh, if somebody didn't have any lakes, didn't have any lakes, what more would it add to the explanation for why he can't walk, can't run, to say that he has a bad attitude or he adopted the wrong strategy? He doesn't have legs, and that's why he can't run. Just, 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 just a second. In 1917, after the destruction of World War I, in 1921, after the additional destruction caused by the Russian Civil War, there was very little with which to build socialism. Socialism is not simply an idea. It ha is a practice based upon that idea, but it requires certain material conditions. The number one lesson of Marxist materialism is that you can't build something with nothing. And when the Soviets got started, they had as close to nothing as you can get in terms of the material and social conditions which were necessary in terms of for example, uh, a great deal of wealth, uh, an industrial base which can produce far more, uh, complex, uh, developed organizational structures, skilled and educated workers who are uh, a majority in the population. None of this was the case. And an unfriendly world. And a, and a, and a, a world yeah. which was actually uh, in the process of uh, invading the Soviet Union during their civil war. In China, the case was very similar. So what they went on to do, uh, the, the leaders in those countries, I think, were socialists. I have no, no uh, hesitation in, in admitting that. 
uh, and they would have liked to build socialism, but the wherewithal to do so uh, just wasn't available. What they went on and, and did in those countries has very little in common with socialism and very little really in common with capitalism either. And our problem is not to have the right, uh, uh, the, the theory and, and the language with which to describe what they actually did, which was different than both socialism and capitalism. All right. I grant you all of that, but I, I would have to say that uh, socialist activists of the next 60 years after the Russian Revolution did not have uh, your attitude that socialism would, uh, that, uh, and, uh, let's put it this way, it's sort of an impossible, unreal question, but uh, what would you have done if you were uh, uh, one of the uh, socialist leaders of, of the Soviet Union? Would you have abandoned the attempt inst instead of having it lead to a kind of uh, impossible, repressive, terroristic, murderous society? What would you have done? Well, I do think they had some choices. I don't think it had to be all the, ter the terrible things that you said. One, tr one possibility was not socialism. I think they could have done more or less what Castro has done in Cuba, uh, by, uh, by which I mean you have there a dictatorial society, but an egalitarian one, uh, one without cor much corruption, uh, one which uh, respects uh, most civil liberties of the people, uh, one which uh, tries its best within the, the given the range of material conditions that they've inherited, tries its best to do what it can for the well-being of the people. Right. I think that that is possible, and I have... I, a I, little I repression goes a long way, though, if you're the one who's in jail. Uh, uh, I'm not sure there's more people in jail than Cuba. I expect and, there's many and, less and there than in the United the States for political reasons. It's going to disappear now with the... Uh, uh, it's a deduction of foreign capital. It disappear. I don't think it's going to disappear. I think it's going to be modified some, and, for, and, and I'm right. just disappointed that that's happening. But let's go back to your first question, because it's an important one. I just don't want it to be a way of talking about the Soviet Union, because I don't think the Soviet Union is really relevant to the right. future of socialism, right, which, where, okay. I, where I think we're talking about us here. All right, then, what we all right, yeah, okay, that's good. But how do you explain, then, the obsession of... Uh, the entire uh, left movement in the last 60 years with the Soviet uh, 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 well, experiment. Well, first of all, you're exaggerating. I don't think you were ever obsessed, and I consider you a part Are of you the kidding? You I, were I, well, when I, was, I, I wasn't. I, I, I never been Well, obsessed. all right, in 1936, when I was 13, yeah. I joined my first communist front organization. Okay. You know why? Yeah. In, in high school. Because yeah. there wasn't, wasn't anything else. Uh -huh. And. Uh, well, and I was around the Trotskyites, yeah. and they were, they centered also on the Soviet Union, and, and uh, had a severe critique of it, but that was the center of it. Mm -hmm. And I, my impression is that even even the anarchists say that uh, the, there were anarchists who, who joined up with the Bolsheviks, and uh, thought they, uh, many of them became mock, became Bolsheviks. Yeah, well, the look, rest got uh, right, 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 the right from the start. There was so a tell of, me about your. Uh, your I, I, I was never involved in either uh, in any kind of pro-Soviet organization. So when did you be well? And I've never. And I've, it's I, not a question of being uh, the Trotskyites were not. Uh, many I was of never. Them were not. I was never obsessed in the way you say you were. Yeah, but you're very. Obsessed. No, no, I don't think so, truly. I think you're you're, you're wrong about that. There was a, a big section of the left that you are describing and an equally big and any bigger section that I would think you not, which was critical. So when did you become a uh, Marxist in what year? Uh, when or I started thinking of myself as a Marxist, probably in the late 50s, early, around 1960. All right, all right. So yeah. by that time, uh, the crimes of Stalin were obvious. Sure, right. sure. All right, so, all right, so let's just leave and it I, up to 1960. Yeah. Wasn't the, the left movement from 1920 to 1960 left, completely involved with the Soviet Union? Look, you're making, you're, you're, you're making mashed potatoes of the left movement. The, the, the left movement, uh, one of its strengths and weaknesses is that it, had, it comes in, in so many pieces. And some of the elements were, and some of the elements weren't, and, and, and okay. others were involved in other kinds of During the 60s, things started. No, before that, too late. Before that, I was involved in socialist movements 
before I became a Marxist in the late 50s. Uh, and and uh, we were not involved. What groups were there? Can you tell me? Sure. It was a group called the Student League for Industrial Democracy, yeah. which they was a socialist they, group. Yeah. Well, affiliated. no, it wasn't connected to any particular oh, party. Okay. It was an educational yeah. kind of socialist well, my, group. My, my wish, a wishy washy one. Okay. Which I, I'm, I'm much but more radical, much more okay. socialist now than I was then. But, but these were all very minuscule groups. All the social, uh, socialist groups. Compared to the Communist Party. At that and time, the at, at the that time, the Communist Party and the Trotskyists were also minuscule. I don't think the Communist the high, like the high period for the Communist Party was the 30s. Uh, but well, again, to I think you are. Um, you're getting off on a tangent. Do you want to talk right. about the future of socialism? Okay, all this right. is not a all discussion right. no, no, about no, no, I don't the, want to the Soviet Union. For the rest of the uh, but but if you want to discuss why the Soviet Union collapsed, it's an interesting discussion. I don't, I don't think, and I think this is very important, I don't think the Soviet experience, its successes, and there were some, like Sputnik or helping to win World War II, I don't think its successes nor its failures. They only lost because of its bureaucratic or I don't think its successes or its failures have any lessons for all us right. here and now. And that's what's so, important. All right, so start though from, if you would, from the uh, relationship of all the old, uh, a large segment of the, uh, uh, of the radical movement, which feels uh, the, people, the people who were uh, fixated on the Soviet Union, these people, many of them have now, you know, sort of felt that socialism has no future, right? Mm -hmm. So let's start from that point and uh, tell us what you think will and sh uh, should happen. Well, I see socialism as something which comes about in order to deal with the problems which arise within capitalism and which get worse within capitalism using means which are themselves made available by capitalism. And therefore, socialism has to be understood as something which comes after capitalism. And capitalism, uh, Marx and the Marxist traditions recognize, did extraordinary things. Uh, produced an amount of wealth and an ability to produce wealth uh, which is greater than had ever been produced uh, before. Uh, at the same time, and, and through this same process, uh, it created enormous e inequalities. It uh, uh, didn't bring about slavery, but developed and, and uh, a slave, this slavery in, in certain places. It uh, got involved in certain uh, forms of uh, colonialism, which we call imperialism, which, which were extremely brutal. Uh, it uh, creates, uh, well, I, I can go on and on in terms of the problems of capitalism, which come about uh, within capitalism, and capitalism uh, relying as it does upon the, uh, the capitalists and their interest in maximizing profit, giving them the power to decide what is going to happen in the economy uh, based upon uh, actions which take off from such, uh, from such goals. Capitalism does not have it with, with, within it as a system to solve these problems. Okay. Consequently, socialism comes along as a way in order to solve those problems uh, at, at, uh, at, at a level of civilization, which is, is possible because of the, the successes of capital. All right, let me say two things. Uh, you know, anarchists have discovered or used the fact that in, uh, in uh, medieval peasant society in Europe, there were 100, which has always been considered a kind of horrible thing, there were 100 same states, which meant that no one worked. So my point is, let, let, I know I'm, I don't have the, uh, the specific instances, but we're talking about the idea of progress. Now, haven't there been societies, small places and, and, and other places that were not as, in, as industrial advanced as we are today, that were closer to, to what some people would call a socialist ideal? Isn't that possible? That's half of the question. The other question is, uh, Marx had the Hegelian idea, I think it's Hegelian, although he's, all of these philosophers borrowed from people before him, of, of the idea of progress, and that the, he, he, Hegel at least felt, and I think, does Marx, 
does, do Marxists feel that there's an inevitable progress from, cap, from capitalism to socialism? Because I know, I know more about Marx's life than about his, uh, his philosophy, which, of history, which changed, uh, like I keep, couldn't keep track of the change, and you know, got addicted to the But uh, Marx thought the revolution was going to happen in 1848, then it was moved up, uh, well, 47, then it was moved up to 48, 49. It kept moving up in his lifetime. I don't, I don't uh, blame him for believing that, for wanting to believe that, because I believe, I want to believe the same thing. But uh, this idea of progress and that capitalism must lead to, uh, or will lead to uh, socialism, I mean, might it, uh, might it not as well lead to a kind of 1984 Orwellian kind of uh, horror society, which we, uh, which we see symptoms of right now in, in uh, the sort of discarding of uh, unnecessary uh, people all over the world? My answer to your two questions to me is yes and yes. <laughs> your first question about whether there have been, let's call them social experiments, different times and places, often very small, which give us some idea of what socialism could be. Yeah, sure. And that's how uh, uh, socialism as an idea arose, and it arose before Marx, and Marx contributes to this idea in, in a rather special way. Uh, but these were all small experiments, and now we have to think about a world with over five billion people on it, and whether it's possible for the entire world be organized in a way which makes not only uh, possible for people to have decent lives, but which doesn't destroy the the, the, uh, the conditions for human life on the planet. That uh, this is now the the problem before us. Now, as to whether it is inevitable that socialism will come, uh, I don't think so, and Marx didn't think so. Marx talked about a uh, possibility of something he called barbarism as, as an alternative. Uh, he was, as, it, as you rightly point out, rather optimistic about socialism coming and, and coming relatively soon. I don't share that optimism. Uh, I, I think uh, if, uh, what more likely, in terms of the developments that you mentioned and the others that you could have, that barbarism of one kind or another, such as we see now developing in Yugoslavia and, uh, and some other places in the world, that, that, to me, is a very real possibility. But if socialism is only like is only a small possibility, given the alternatives, which are not only bar barbarism is the main one, another one is rendering life on this planet impossible through destruction of uh, the ecology. Uh, if those are the only two alternatives to some form of socialism. Even if socialism is not uh, as likely as Marx believed, it's something that every rational human being has to has to struggle for. I, I don't see I don't see as an alternative the uh, the continuation of the present society uh, let's call it democratic capitalism. I think the rug is pulled being pulled out from under it and it's here where Marx's analysis is particularly valuable right. because he describes just what what is happening which is making capitalism as it's now existing increasingly impossible. Well, uh, it, 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 it's, in other words, there's a difference. There's a difference to me between the inevitability of the collapse of capitalism, which Marx did believe in and which I agree with. There's a difference between that and believing the inevitability of socialism following capitalism, where Marx was too optimistic, but it remains a possibility. Yeah, I think he was. Uh, I think the barbarism occurs in one or two places, where the optimism occurs in a lot of places. And after each uh, business turned down in Europe and each war, uh, he really thought it was, uh, you know, like who was supposed to have set prosperity around the corner, who was just around the corner, you know, as I mean, said that urban movement. So I think. Uh, but there, look, to me, uh, sort of there, there were periods of, um, of, of social revolution uh, that swept the developed countries. Uh, and they, you mentioned 1848. Uh, the post-World War I period is, is another time. Uh, revolutions didn't only occur in, in Russia, but also in Hungary, where there was a communist government for three months. Uh, throughout Germany, uh, many German cities, including Berlin, had worker governments uh, composed of workers for periods of up to two weeks. 
and there were similar revolts in a number of other places. Uh, e e even the United States experienced more class struggle in that year, the year 1919, than any time before or right. since. Well, the, the, when so, the German Revolution collapsed, I think it sealed the fate of the uh, Russian Revolution, the Revolution, I, I, and the rest of the uh, I think that's true, the but, but what, what but this shows... What this, is not enough. No, no, but what this shows, and also the period just after World War II, when there was uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, there were the possibilities of social revolution in places like Greece uh, and, and Italy. Right. Uh, now, but 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 in, in 1968 is a period not of social right. revolution, but a great deal of social turmoil, right. which gave an indication. Things happen all the time, I believe. No, they don't were, happen all the time. No, they happen sometimes. Yeah, even. no, they happen uh, often enough because I believe in the fundamental uh, possibilities of human biology. But then you have to explain. I am. You have to explain why they were crushed so easily. And my, uh, I think Debs once said that, uh, see I'm a pacifist to complicate things. He said, uh, if you have the majority of the people really with you, you have to use the word really. And you called it democratic capitalism. I wouldn't flatter it with the word democratic. He said if you had the, the majority of the people with you, and I would add really with you, then you don't need violence. And if you don't have it, then violence is not enough. And what we had in all those Europeans, the post-World War I revolution, was a coup, a coup, an attempt to seize state power. And uh, they didn't succeed. Two weeks, and even the Paris Commune, which is the most uh, tragic of all, I think, uh, they also uh, didn't succeed. In other words, don't you need an incredible cultural uh, is a very broad and uh, economic uh, revolution or conversion to have uh, uh, revolutions that really work. Well, you're looking at revolutions from only one side, from the side of the people who are trying to make it and bring about the change. To understand any revolution and the possibility of it being successful, you have to look at it from the other side as well. What's going on? Uh, on the side of people who hold power. Uh, they, they may be uh, disintegrating. Uh, th this is what you saw in Eastern Europe. Who would have thought that the kind of social changes which occurred in Eastern Europe from 1989 on would have uh, occurred as relatively nonviolently as they did? And, okay, and, and it's, not, it's not because, but wait a second, it's not because of what was being done by the people who were making those revolutions, but what was, in, what was happening on the other side. So if, uh, in, if capitalism collapses and, and the government in capitalism loses its ability to govern, and that could, various things are being suggested there, then you might have the kind of change happening within right. capitalism so that you, we've seen in other So places. you think the change in Eastern Europe were in advance? No, I think they were a revolution, though. Well, a revolution, but, you know, we... Uh, well, we advanced. To define, uh, we have to, turn, to define the term revolution. A uh, change for its own sake, they're all... No, like, no, it's not a question of change for its own sake. Government but, changes in Africa, where one uh, monster right. replaces another. No, a revolution, we should... I, I try to define it by uh, getting at the... starting with the etymology of the, of the, of the term and it has to do with the turn of the wheel, the complete turn of the wheel. And what a, re a revolution is, is a complete change in a society uh, from what was the case politically, economically, and socially to something very different and, and often opposed. So then you had, you had a Nazi and a fascist revolution. In I like to reserve the term for, revolution. for a movement in the right direction. Uh, no, I, I, I think, yes, no, I think Hitler's uh, coming to power uh, in Germany represents a fascist revolution for me. And, and likewise, and likewise... Right, so then we have different... Uh, and, and to me, and revolution always has to be in the left direction. All right, so let's yeah. forget about that term. Or, but let's proceed then. How much time do we have uh, to make Six the minutes. revolution? How many? Six minutes. Uh, let's postpone this for the next session. And uh, we're moving now to the uh, to Cafe Weimar for a little entertainment. <laughs> And uh, our patron, uh, that founder of Cafe Weimar, he, he knew that something was going to happen during Weimar, is uh, Jerry Garcia. No, it's Karl Marx. I think with Jerry, 
Garcia wanted to imitate. This is an anonymous uh, drawing that I blew up. Is that the right word? <laughs> okay. Now, tell us what you're going to read and okay. go to so it. A little, a little action here. The stage is yours. Tui has asked me to read a poem, and so I've chosen one of my favorite poems, which was written by Bertolt Brecht. The poem is called, A Reader, A Worker Reads History. Who built the seven gates of Thebes? The books are filled with names of kings. Was it kings who hauled the craggy blocks of stone? And Babylon, so many times destroyed, who built the city up each time? In which of Lima's houses, that city glittering with gold, lived those who built it? In the evening when the Chinese wall was finished, where did the Masons go? Imperial Rome is full of arcs of triumph. Who reared them up? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? Byzantium lives in song. Were all her dwellings palaces? And even in Atlantis of the legend, the night the sea rushed in, the drowning men still bellowed for their slaves. Young Alexander conquered India. He alone? Caesar beat the Gauls. Was there not even a cook in his army? Philip of Spain wept as his fleet was sunk and destroyed. Were there no other tears? Frederick the Great triumphed in the Seven Years' War. Who triumphed with him? Each page a victory. At whose expense the victory ball? Every ten years a great man. Who paid the piper? So many particulars. So many questions. Oh, well, thank you. How much time do we have? We'll be back. We have four minutes? Actually, three. Three minutes. Um, is there anything you want to say to sum up what we've discussed now? Because next week we're going to discuss how to make the revolution. Well, well not next week, but uh, down the line. I think, I think you move too far too fast. Uh, you've got to understand what the society we're living in is like, how it works. All right, uh, three minutes, Philip. No, no, I, I can't, but I'm saying you've okay. got to understand that, how it works, uh, w where it's come from, uh, how it's developed, uh, as well, of course, as uh, who benefits most from the society and who benefits least, and then where the society seems to be tending, given, given uh, how it works. These are the kinds of things that Marx 99% of Marx's writings are devoted to, and it's coming out of that kind of analysis that you can begin even to raise questions of what kind right, of change but, is possible and how people contribute. And would instead, say. instead, you, like too many Americans to me, rush to the bottom line. It is the bottom line. We want to know whether uh, a, a radical social change is possible and what can follow it. But we can't get to the bottom line before going through these steps, otherwise we just exchange bias. Right, I mean, it's just, it's just not... You may ask.